my day started on 9-11, I was at work. We had the TVs on. We saw the news cut in and we saw that the first plane had hit. Ray had done a mutual, which means swift, uh, switching shifts with another fireman. So the other fireman worked for him and he would later on take his, the other fireman's shift. So he and three other firemen went golfing for the day. So they weren't there when the first tower fell. And when they heard what happened, they raced back and they got there as the second tower was hit. Um, and Ray had known that his whole firehouse was there and he knew that they were called inside and they were up there. So the second tower fell and then it was just a nightmare after that. It was just, you know, we knew they were gonna be gone. And so I spent the day at home with Ray's father and my neighbor I had taken the kids out of school and we were drinking wine and answering the phone every hour on the hour, talking with the firemen and the widows and trying to get updates. They couldn't find any of Ray's guys in that horrible, horrible sight. Um, and one of the widows was Ray's best friend was Mike Otten and um, we know Mike was gone. We was praying just all day long that they were gonna be okay or just found somewhere and they weren't. So anyway, Ray spent probably, I guess three to four months nonstop searching and rescuing for his friends and, and Ray knew so many people. He was like the mayor of the fire department. He was a trustee in Manhattan and worked in so many different firehouses. And of course, all the firehouses that were there were people and firemen that he knew. And uh, I just can't even tell you how many of them were killed on that day. We spent so many months going to memorials and funerals and just, you know, dedicated things for these poor guys that were never found. And it was just so horrible. And I'm still very, I, I sound shaky because it's hard when I talk about it because I just, you know, you just can't forget it. And uh, Ray just changed completely to a whole different kind of person, um, with depression and anxiety and, so pretty much after that, he had to get out of that firehouse because he just couldn't go in anymore. And he ended up working with Chief Pfeiffer, who was not related to us, but the same last name. And he worked at Fort Totten and his brother was actually killed in the tower. Chief Pfeiffer was actually doing the command post in the building downstairs and sent them all up. Um, so anyway, Ray became his aide and they worked together, they, they got each other through it and um, counseled each other, I guess you would say. And um, what did Ray do after that? So then Ray was assigned to Fort Totten where a lot of the guys that were on, that were hurt or mentally or physically hurt would come to Fort Totten and they would stay there temporarily until they you know, got better and went back to their firehouse. In 2009, Ray was diagnosed with cancer. It was a stage four kidney cancer, um, which traveled. And what happened was uh, Ray, we tried to do radiation and chemotherapy. We did it for a while, but didn't do anything to help. The chemotherapy actually weakened his heart, which caused a lot of issues for his heart, which caused Ray to have a heart attack. So Ray was working for a while with stage four cancer. But at the point when he had the heart attack, they could no longer let him work anymore because he was a liability. So Ray was devastated. It was September of 2015 and Ray had to retire. Um, he loved that job more than anything in the world. That was his life and um, he was devastated. So he retired, you know, didn't want to, but he did. And um, I guess you would say the next few years we just spent going to doctors and surgeries and as his cancer spread to his bones which was very painful um, he lost his his femur had to re be replaced a couple of times his shoulder and then it it finally got to his brain um, it was just horrible but um, we got through it and my daughter and I and my son you know took care of him and sat through all the surgeries and just prayed that 
and he was a fighter. I mean, he fought hard. He did, was not going anywhere. He did not want to go. So, um, and we wanted him to be home. We knew the end was coming, but he did not want to go into a hospice. Unfortunately, at the very end, we couldn't control his pain and he did have to go. But in between all this, while he was fighting the cancer and going through all these surgeries, he was also down in Washington, D.C. with, and you probably know, with John Stewart and John Feel and all the guys, and they were advocating for the 9-11 World Trade Center health bill, which would cover all the guys and their families for health insurance for the rest of their lives. So that actually got passed on my son's birthday. I think it was December 18th. And then they started, uh, there was a, um, it was the victim's compensation bill was the second legislation that they were working on. Before that got passed, Ray passed away. I was asked to join and I joined the group and I went down to DC a few times and saw these senators and I don't want to talk about what kind of people, but fighting that they didn't want this to pass and the victim's compensation would allow all the widows and the, and the families to be able to survive money wise and just help them with things that they, they couldn't do anymore. Their husbands were gone and they had to go on with their families and their homes and but anyway, so that finally got passed and they're covered, um, I think, till 2021 or something like, like nine years or more than that. I forget how many years. So that was a big, big successful event. And we were down in D.C. with the president as he signed the bill. And it was just so, so I was just so proud to be with them and to finish Ray's legacy, which he started and. I mean, he was down there in his wheelchair. They were pushing him through the halls of the Senate and the Congress and, you know, begging these guys, these senators to please, please, you know, and explain to them what they were all going through physically and mentally. I guess a lot of people don't understand, you know, what these guys were left with. They didn't die on 9-11, but they did. They mentally died. And we had to watch our loved ones suffer in pain for those next 10 years or how many years they got to live and of course today they're still dying and and you know it's just we don't know when it's going to ever end because now we worry about the children you know having children and, and is there something in there it's just you just you just pray it's going to end one day but you'll never forget i mean we will never forget and i get so choked up when i talk about it because i just I'm just devastated um, that he's not here anymore. And, um, you know, I'm carrying on as best as I can with, for my children. Um, my son is a city fireman. Uh, Ray got to see his name on a list before he died. And Ray, uh, Terrence was way up there on the list. So that really made Ray proud. And he, um, so Ray was assigned to, is, works in the Bronx. He's in um, Engine 72 in the Bronx, a little bit crazy firehouse, but he loves it. And my daughter Taylor lives with me and we, um, she, she just lost her job due to uh, the COVID. So she's home now and we're hoping we can get her a job. But um, anyway, it's just, you know, anxiety, depression, loneliness. Um, when things go wrong in the house, I just look up and, and ask him, you know, why did you leave us? What do I do? Um, you know, we're all okay surviving. You know, we, we're taken care of and, and, and I'm still working full time, but um, I have to because that gets me out of the house. It gets me dressed. Um, I'm talking with people all day and uh, I don't know if I'll ever be able to stop working. But there's never a moment that goes by that I don't think about Ray and, you know, memories and our, our good times and you know, it's just, it's so hard to believe. And it's just, I know I have to go on, but it's very, very hard. And uh, everyone tells me you should go on with your life. And I'm trying, trying the best I can. I can't imagine the guilt Ray had to live with mm -hmm. swapping shifts mm -hmm. with a brother who then died. Mm -hmm. Did he talk about that to you? 
It was very hard for him to talk about, but Steve was um, one of his best friends. And, um, you know, of course he must have, he had the guilt. He had such guilt. Um, he had guilt that he wasn't there that day, that he should have been dead. Not just the guy, you know, he should have been the one. And, um, you know, it's very hard when I see Steve's wife and I just don't know what to say, you know. I mean, it, they all do mutuals. It's just a common thing in the firehouses. And they'll even switch over to a different firehouse for the day. And it's what they do. You know, he, they, and, and that day with the, uh, you know, when they were digging and searching, I mean, they, they're breathing in the poison and all that. And they would have done it anyway. You know, they were looking for their brothers and their sisters. I mean, they would have done it anyway, even though they were told the air was clean and, you know, I'm sure they knew it wasn't, it had to be poison and, you know, and now they're all suffering because of it, but they would have done it anyway. That's what they do, you know? How old was your son, who later became an FDNYer himself, uh, how old was your son in 2001 when all this went down? So he was in middle school. They were both in middle school. No, no, I'm sorry. They were in elementary school. I'm going to say maybe 11 and 12. They're both about a year apart, but they were young because they were in the elementary school when I ran to get them, which was right, you know, a block away. So they were very young. So they lived with this. We are nine eleven family. We lived with this. We lived with all our friends who go, went through it and they understand. And, um, you know, we did what we had to do. We'll always be a nine, a part of nine eleven families, you know? And despite your son seeing the hell that Ray went through, he was diagnosed at stage four. Mm -hmm. diagnosed at stage four and people I'm telling you I hear that same story over and over and over again right. where these first responders at first pain at first sign that something's wrong these are like cancers on steroids but yet yeah. at what point did your son decide I'm following in dad's footsteps I'm going to do this despite what happened to him despite watching this as I grew up how old was he when he made that decision I'm gonna say uh, when Terrence was very young he always wanted to be a fireman he was so proud of his father um, you know he wasn't afraid and he just wanted to be a fireman just like Ray and um, he was excited about it but um, Terrence was first EMS so he did, he did EMS for about three years. He started young, I'm trying to think. And then he went on to, uh, you know, the fire department part. But, um, you know, and everybody knows Ray. Like, just, he's so well known. And, you know, Terrence always has guys, the older guys coming up to him and saying, are you Ray Pfeiffer's son? And it's, you know, he really made a name for himself, how he just wasn't going to leave until he helped his brothers, you know, with the compensation and all that what what people may forget or maybe they don't know about ray and you mentioned this was despite having stage four cancer he went to washington he mm -hmm. lobbied for the zadroga bill and for the longest time until 2011 right they weren't provided for they were just left to twist these first responders. Mm -hmm. Nobody was taking care of them. Nobody was giving free health care. No one was giving compensation to the families or them for lives destroyed. Mm -hmm. and, and you can hear from Karen that regardless, it, it, it's impossible to make that life completely whole again. Right. But it right. was, Ray became the poster boy for the Zadroga bill. The lawmakers couldn't ignore this man in a wheelchair so obviously suffering. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Ray helped get through, to, through many of them. John uh, Stewart was the bad cop, as everybody heard. He'd go down the hall and embarrass them or whatever. I mean, John was an amazing, is an amazing guy who just did so much and he really was unbelievable. And John Phil, of course, but Ray was the good cop and Ray would, you know, be very polite to them and, and explain to them what the families are going through. And 
if these guys are dying and if they knew their families were going to be okay, it might make it the dying a little easier, you know, and that's, that was Ray's part, but he was not leaving until that got passed. And uh, thank God it did. I spoke with Ray's two sisters several years ago, and they told me that he carried such guilt because of swapping shifts, the mutual, mm -hmm. that when he was diagnosed, they told me that when he was diagnosed with stage four cancer, it was like a weight was lifted off his shoulders. He felt relief mm -hmm. that he was sick. What was that like for you? Well, I understood it because of the guilt that he felt that why didn't he die that day? Why did his friends die and not him? So now he's got stage four cancer and now he feels, okay, now I'm getting punished. Good. Except he really suffered that many years, um, really suffering. And, uh, you know, it was the guilt. It was absolutely the guilt. You know, I wanted him to go for help and just to talk and to somebody and he just refused. What do these people know about 9-11? What do they know about my brother's and sisters that perished that day? And, he just wasn't going to help himself. But um, like, I think that they were right, that he did, he felt that he was being punished and he deserved to be punished. And another amazing part of the Ray Pfeiffer legacy, besides getting the Zadroga bill passed mm -hmm. so that Anyone who had a 9-11 illness, whether you lived in the community or you worked in the community or you volunteered in the community, they're also covered by the Zadroga Bill. Mm -hmm. But the beautiful legacy that lives on to this day, continuing to help ailing first responders, mm -hmm. is the Ray Pfeiffer Foundation. So Karen, please tell us about that. When was it formed? What, how did it come about? Mm -hmm. and, and tell us, share what it does. Absolutely. Um, it was a few firemen that got together after Ray passed away um, that were from the firehouse and also our friend Lori, um, who was a big, you know, a good friend to the firehouse. They put together a foundation where they run fundraisers and which, which they buy medical equipment for sick firemen that don't have it covered but, you know most of them are in world trade center healthcare, um but a lot of things are not covered that people don't realize um lifts to get them out of their beds um hospice uh in-home nursing you know whether it's a wheelchair whatever they need and it's always all brand new equipment and they would get the phone call of somebody that needed help and they would be there in a second and and it didn't matter what it cost but they were there to help and and they're doing this in Ray's name, and I know Ray is so proud watching what they do to help all these poor guys, you know. It's, they're amazing, and every year we have a fundraiser golf out, and, and uh, unfortunately this year we can't have it because of the COVID, but um, hopefully next year we will. We have so many generous donators um, that really help get it going. So This is going to be painful but I, I wanted you to tell us, if you can, about your last moments with Ray, your last conversation with Ray. So Ray was in hospice. We had to move him to, um, I think it was up in Roslyn. And uh, he was good for the first week. He was himself, he was on the phone. John Stewart would be calling him. He would be joking, guys from the firehouse would call people looking for transfers and Ray would still help them and make the phone calls and just whatever. Ray just helped everybody. But, um, so the second week is when things started changing and, um, his pain was not controllable. So what they did was, of course, everyone knows that they just keep giving you more morphine and more morphine until you're not awake anymore. And, um, the last day was a Sunday and I'm just trying to remember we were all there, but there's a family room, and most of them were in a fam were in the family room, and I was with Ray by myself, and I said, "Can you know to everybody? Can you please give me a few minutes?" And we knew it was so close, and um, just the way he was breathing, and um, and I just held his hand, and I said, "Ray, it's okay. Um, 
we've been through a lot and don't worry, I'll be okay. I'll take care of the kids and I love you so much. And please show me signs that you're still with us. And, um, and I, I was, and I hate to say it like this, but I never saw anybody pass away. And, um, I just have, I always, I guess you call it PS, whatever the heck it's called, but, um, PTSD. I just remember him taking that last breath and I've never seen anybody do that. And it just devastated me. But anyway, I know he's at peace and, um, there's no more pain. Um, and of course my family were all there and his sisters and brothers and, um, my son and what they did for him was unbelievable. His, um, he was also a volunteer fireman and how they treated him like, a, um, they came in with the American flag and they took him out and, and just everybody standing at attention. It was just, I've never seen anything like this that they did for anybody. And I, I, I mean, I think they don't do it for everybody, but it was just so amazing. Like I didn't know what I was looking at and just his funeral. And, and we had a wake, a one day wake. It was at a firehouse and um, hours and hours of people waiting in line to come and see him. And um, uh, they were all waiting in line to see him. Cause, and we only had it the one day because I didn't think I could handle it more than the one day. It was a lot of hours. But um you know, just memories of people that came from all over in different states and would say, God, he was my idol and what he did for everybody. And, and I had to come and see him and I'm going through it now too. And God bless you and your family. And I'll never forget, you know, all the people that came and just, and the church, the mass was, I can't even talk about the mass. Like I don't even, it was televised because there were so many people there that they couldn't even get near the church. And the city guys and the um god everybody was there and it was just beautiful with the fire trucks and the music and we had very special music that i picked out that i knew ray would love and but um you know it's something thank god we somebody taped it i guess one of the tv uh channels channel 11 or whatever they had it all taped and i got to see it again because of course that day you know i don't remember everything but it was amazing um the mayor was there and um, commissioner, fire commissioner, and just, you know, just made me feel so good how people love, you know. You asked Ray for signs. Have you had signs? Absolutely. Tell us. I see signs all the time, and it's mainly in, in your laugh because everybody says it, but when I look at my backyard, there's always that red car <laughs> And he's behind a tree or he's somewhere and, and I talk to him. I said, who else could it be? I'm like, it's, it's, it's him. He's watching. And, it, and it's funny because if we talk about Ray, we're in the kitchen or something. I was just recently with my sisters and we were, oh, Ray would know the answer to that. We were saying or whatever. And sure enough, the front window in the kitchen, we see a red cardinal on the, on the fence staring at us. And, and I mean, I think those are my signs. I, I don't really... May we say electricity and, and, and stuff like that? Well, well, I have a lot of that. You know, bulbs will go out or things will flicker. And um, I just really wish I could see him. I know I'll see him again, but I mean, just, you know, just to talk, just to talk again and hold each other and tell him we're okay. And he's with his parents, so he's taking care of them. And uh, I don't know. Oh, you know what he said before he died? I have to say this. Who did he ask? I think he asked the priest. There was a priest that was praying over him. We were all there. And I remember him saying to the priest, is there Wi-Fi up in heaven? Am I going to be able to, you know, because Ray had to be involved in everything. He had to know everything we were doing and and I guess he was concerned about how he was, you know, with a, whether it's a text or whatever, like an email. But I never forget that he asked that. He was a computer guy, you know, always on the phone, the computer. And um, wouldn't that be something if there was Wi-Fi there, up there, and he could talk to us, tell us how he's doing. He's no more pain. The pain is gone. But you know what? And, and I shouldn't even be talking about this, but my daughter's devastated. She's probably going to get married next year. 
without her father being there. And that, that's going to be a tough one. And my son is supposed to get married this year. So it's, you know, that's going to be hard. That's going to be very hard. Um, but we'll have to get through it, right? And he'll be smiling. He will. He he'll will be, be smiling. Mm -hmm. He will be with us in spirit. I want to thank you, Karen Pfeiffer. I know this was really, really difficult. It's really, really important, though, that future generations know Ray Pfeiffer and the legacy he has left and continues to leave. He continues to help. Mm -hmm. And I thank you. I know that was really, really difficult. It's so hard. It's so hard to talk about it, you know. I'm honored that you shared it with us. Thank you. Thank you so much. I Thank hope you, it helps. Karen. And God bless you and America. Yeah.